everybody. We are live, getting ready to go live for the weekly broadcast of the podcast This Week in Science. Thank you for joining us tonight. In case uh, you did not know that this is a live broadcast, bing, 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 we're live. And uh, this is unedited. And Alan, um, who's joining me tonight on the show, you know, any mistakes we made at all tonight, not edited out. It's just all there. Warts and all. You ready for this, Alan? Uh, hmm. Can I change my mind? <laughs> nope. Too late. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the podcast will be edited, and I hope that you all enjoy the show. Remember to click those likes and subscribes and all of the things that help us make the algorithms like us more. And are we ready? Or is the audio all right, everyone? Are we ready to start the show? My Discord... Are you ready? You're here. I see you. You be live. Yes. All right. I'm super quiet again. I didn't do anything differently. Identity. I'll give it a little tiny boost and see if that helps. I'll be on it. Okay. Anyway, we will begin. Let's get this show going in three, two, this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 950, recorded on Wednesday, November 8th, 2023. What's the cosmic log on science? Hey, everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we are going to fill your heads with yeast, robots, and cats. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. It's through experiences when young that we find ourselves when older. Our experiences shape who we, shape us and who we want to be, eventually leading to who we become. Today is National STEM or STEAM Day, a day to encourage children toward a love of science, technology, engineering, and math that might one day lead them to a career in one of those spaces. But really, is one day enough? Shouldn't we encourage our children to embrace curiosity and making every day? Shouldn't we? And isn't every day an opportunity for people of any age to experience the world anew, to embrace a new interest, whether for hobby or for economy, we make every day a celebration of STEM or STEAM or whatever acronym you prefer here on This Week in Science. Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. Good science. It doesn't sound right coming out of me. Justin's voice is much better at doing this, but he is off doing science right now. Thank you all for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. And we have a great show ahead. We really do. On the show, we have all sorts of science news. I have news stories about editing some yeast, bodiless starfish. I mean, how do you have a starfish that doesn't have a body? Lots of robots and lots of cats. And we are joined by the wonderful Alan Boyle, science writer and host of the Fiction Science Podcast. Thank you for joining. Welcome to the show, Alan. Well, as they say, glad to be here. I hope. How, how many you... times have you heard that? <laughs> <laughs> One or two. Yeah, mm -hmm, a couple. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. You come. Oh, glad to be. I hope that you really are glad to be here. And I hope that we can enjoy a little bit of science conversation. Are you ready? Sure, yeah, let's do it. 
I don't think, I mean, you've, you've written about science, you podcast, you have a little experience. You're ready? You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I think your question was, what is the Cosmic Log? And uh, Cosmic Log has been around for 22 years. So it's, I've, as, I've been around the block. So About, about as long as let's, this let's week in science. This. Yeah. Let's do it. All mm -hmm. right. Okay, everyone, as we jump into the show tonight, I want to remind you that subscribing to This Week in Science as a podcast on your favorite podcast platform is a wonderful thing to do. If you're not yet subscribed, go to wherever you find your podcast, if it's Spotify or Apple or whatever, subscribe to This Week in Science. That's great. You can also find us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch. We stream weekly, 8 p.m. Pacific time-ish on Wednesday nights every week that's what we're working on maybe for a little while it might just be me and my special guests but that's gonna be a lot of fun for you because it'll be a surprise every single week it'll be like one of those um what are those kinder eggs that people get in europe anyway that's a surprise inside if all this is too much information you can find us on social media maybe we're out there but twist.org is the website that's where you can find show notes and all sorts of information about the site Click those likes and everything, because now it's time for science. All right. What is the science this week? I'm going to start us out with a very, I think, exciting long-term scientific project. Researchers involved in a project that is called the Synthetic Yeast Project, have been, uh, they have a, a website that they have been working on since I believe they first reported about what they're doing about 15 years ago or so. And they are working on making a synthetic yeast. We've talked on the show about efforts to make synthetic bacteria and synthetic bacteria are one thing because they're prokaryotes, right? They don't necessarily have a nucleus. Yeast, however, they have a nucleus that's separated from the rest of the cell. There's a membrane that separates the chromosomes from everything else in the cell. And these researchers have been working on basically doing that whole thing where you, you have a boat and you remove a plank and put in a new plank and until you've rebuilt the entire boat or you could do it with a car. I mean, is it the same car? In this case, it is definitely not the same yeast because the researchers have now, have, they've now reported, and it was a suite of cell, of papers that were published in Cell Genomics this last week about their work on the Saccharomyces yeast genome 2.0. They have gotten 14 chromosomes copied, which means they have synthetically created 14 out of 16 chromosomes in this yeast's genome, okay? So they're like, if you could imagine little little chromosomes, little copies of DNA, doop, 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 16 of them, 14 of them they've done. Now, not only have they synthetically copied and made synthetic copies of all those bits of DNA of chromosomes, they have taken some of those chromosomes and put them into the yeast and used yeast mating techniques to get them get these new chromosomes into the yeast so that the yeast cells survive. They have now gotten to the point where they're over 50% syn synthetic chromosomal material. One of the chromosomes is a completely synthetic bit of DNA that's actually transfer RNA. It codes for transfer RNA, which is really important in getting stuff out of the nucleus into the rest of the cell. And in what they've done, they have, they've, they've gotten to a point where they think they can keep going. They definitely are going to be able to create the 16 synthetic chromosomes. It's just a matter of figuring out how much DNA can be removed and synthetically replaced in a yeast cell, a eukaryotic cell with a nucleus before it breaks. How much can be changed? How much has to stay the same to allow the yeast to survive? 
And that's where we, where we are right now. Alan, do you think that we're going to make it to a completely synthetic yeast chromosome? Or uh, not chromosome, but yeast DNA? Well, I think it's possible. Uh, it's a little scary, but uh, they've been working on this for quite a while. You know, Craig Venter has talked about, yeah. you know, what the minimal genome is. How much can you remove and still have something that, that can replicate itself and, and still have that process we call life? Um, and why are they doing this? It's it's not just to be a Franken yeast. Uh, <laughs> I know. It, 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 Is this Franken? <laughs> are we creating Frankenstein's monster? And in, in I, I, I think, think that's so. the fear. I think that's the fear. <laughs> you know, because yeah. uh, but uh, the the application could be, for example, if you want to make biofuel, you could gen and genetically engineer yeast. Uh, it's well suited for making biofuel, or you know you plug in your the thing that you want whether it's pharmaceuticals or or yeah. maybe there's some sort of uh food application you could do for this but i think it there's a little bit of scariness to this too because you are fiddling with the code of life and and so i i'm not totally sold on the idea <laughs> interesting yeah i mean i i think it's fascinating you're coming at this from as you know from your history as a science writer and so there is always that kind of you know what are you know what is the what is the eventual result mm -hmm. from this what are we really trying to do and i think your point bringing up the fact that uh they're trying to you know they say you know we can make medicines we can you synthetically get these yeast to be machines right to do right. what do our bidding <laughs> um but they're biological and so can we keep them I don't know. There's the, you know, the it's control like a aspect. Jurassic Park uh, sequel almost uh, <laughs> that you have to build in yeah. the safeguards. And then you have Malcolm, you know, the the character coming in saying, well, life will find a way. I wish Justin were here to be able to try and do that quote by uh, his uh, that actor who looks like him. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, I mean, I, I find it exciting. I think they are also part of what they're doing and we'll talk more about this later when we talk about cats um, but part of what they're doing is removing repetitive genetic sequences so there are lots of copies of genes in dna right chromosomes in mammals copies of copies of copies 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 how much can you get rid of and still have things work you know, mm -hmm. how much do you really need, you know, like they're do trying to do with the minimal uh, bacterial cell kind of efforts, you know, what do we, what do they really need and what are they going to, you know, mm. what is the, what is needed for life? But that again, uh, you have uh, unintended consequences. If I, if I yeah. could kind of play the Jeff Goldblum character for, for a second here, yeah. uh, that uh, a lot of this DNA, uh, they used to call it junk DNA yeah. or now non-coding DNA, but mm -hmm. it turns out that a lot of that, uh, a lot of that information uh, has an effect on uh, processes that that may not be uh, your traditional DNA coding for protein process. But yep. uh, so you know, you got to be careful when you're doing this. That's the bottom I, line. I. I do hope that the scientists are very careful and continue to be careful and take the responsibility of what they're doing very seriously. I know that that's a, a big conversation these days about the ethics of these kinds of sciences. And so that's why a show like this is useful. You know, you get people <laughs> keyed into all this and then they can have a rational conversation when it comes to deciding what the policy is going to be. Right. I mean, and I, I mean, that's what I hope is that, you know, oh, you do, this is going on as opposed to sensationalism. We can talk about it rationally. And if people have questions, please ask. We will, mm. we will try to our best to answer these questions. Um, but we will, of course, put these uh, links to this story and to the entire synthetic yeast project. They've got a GitHub. They've got all sorts of information. This information uh, that they're working on is public. Actually, it is not uh private behind paywalls. They've been uh, publishing this stuff, which is fairly fascinating. Okay, long-term uh, 
research I always love because it's like the human genome project. What other things are taking decades to complete, right? But moving on from there, other things that we've been studying are viruses. Yay, everybody knows viruses. They give them colds and does bad things, right? But not always, because sometimes viruses are just microbial material that infects other microbes, the bacteria. And in a recent study uh, in Nature, scientists have visualized two viruses linking up together as they entered a bacterial host, which has never been seen before. So to put this in perspective, um, historically, when we talk about the viruses that infect bacteria, they're called phages. Phages are often accompanied by what they call satellite nucleids, which is like little bits of protein that just kind of stick around. And they're like little moons for the viruses. They don't do their own thing. They go with the virus. They're kind of like the virus gang. And when the virus infects the bacteria, those, those little proteins help the virus do what it does, potentially. That's what we think. But there's always this kind of, it's like messy asteroids or moons. And they're, they, they're called satellites. But now, when the student project, and I love this because it's like this kind of this thing that was never expected. It was a student project where the students were imaging viruses, these phages entering bacteria, and the researchers thought that they were going to see the same thing they always see, but there was something messy. And they tested again, and they're like, wait, that's messy. What's going on? And so they did some scanning to see what was happening in, uh, in the data, to see exactly what was going on. And they actually were able to image and detect what is now considered, for the first time, a satellite virus. It doesn't have any of its own uh, replicative machinery or any of the uh, genes that would allow it to make, make use of the host cells tools for replicating. And so it's like a it's like a a passenger on this larger virus. But in hell in going in, it also they determined works with the virus to do the business that the virus needs done. Um, so they were looking at these this uh, these particular images, which I I think were where fat, it's a beautiful image of the tail of the satellite virus and the capsid. It's got like a little hexagonal co covering for its genetic material and a little tail. It's like wrapped around the neck of the bigger virus, which is pretty beautiful. And um, in, uh, in what they saw, what they were looking at is what they call a, uh, this phage satellite system. They were originally looking at the mulch and mind flayer viruses, which are phages. And in looking at the mulch and mind flayer viruses, they were later able to spe specifically identify these little helper satellites. And so the mulch mansion has the mulch room that goes with it, and the mind flayer has the mini flare virus that is a satellite that attaches to it. Um, so this flare system, which I is, I, I'm guessing it's from Dungeons and Dragons or from like, Stranger, Stranger Things. things. Yeah, yeah, Stranger Things. <laughs> Watching too much Stranger Things too can really Stranger mess things. you up. Yeah. I mean, years ago it was um, it was video games, but yeah. Anyway, that's. Uh, that's where it is. I, I, I love this story because it's a determining of something new out of something that was expected. So expecting one result, finding something new, and now there's a new category of these little satellite objects that are even smaller than the phages that infect the microbes that, in, that inhabit us and all the life around us. There's little worlds. It's little, it's... 
it's turtles all the way down, Alan. <laughs> well, again, I, I haven't uh, I haven't seen the story. I'll have to catch up with it. But the first thing that comes to mind is, well, what what does this mean for virology and uh, also for fighting viruses? Like, could mm -hmm. could this be a target for future vaccines where you don't go after the mama virus, you go after the messy little baby virus or baby sub virus? Uh, yeah. yeah. Or can you use it for something? You know, viruses have been used for a long time to introduce genetic material into the genome. And, and so maybe this is perhaps there's a less invasive way that you could get transfer of gen genetic material for genetic engineering purposes for gen gene therapy. Uh, if you were to use something like this attached to a benign virus, uh, something that is totally safe. So it. it mm -hmm. You know, and, and so there are potential applications, I suppose, for this. I'll, I'll, I'll have to read up on this, get I, myself I mean, I, up to speed. It's brand new, brand yeah. new. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all have to get up to speed. Um, you know, and, and like I said, it was something, it was a student project that became something much, much more. And uh, sciences like that, researchers never really know what they're going to uncover when they turn over that, I don't know bacterial phage rock. Um, but yeah, in this case, I, I find it interesting because it, for virology, I'd, I'd love to speak to somebody like Vincent Recagnello or uh, someone else who works in this area um, to see really how this could impact the ecology of using like phage treatments and other things that we're looking at for, for fighting infections. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fun times. Um, okay, when you think of uh, life and like, we think of like, hey, I've got a head and like, not, I mean, not just life life, but mammalian life or fish or the forms of life that we're familiar with as not plants and more on the invertebrate, vertebrate side of things. Head, body, maybe some limbs, right? You've got the sensory organs in one place, you've got locomotion or m limbs, you're getting around. <sighs> Starfish. Speaking, speaking of turning over a rock. Right? There you go. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Where is a starfish's head? Apparently it's everywhere. Apparently starfish have gone through an evolutionary process that has com pretty much completely gotten rid of their body. So the hypothesis, hypotheses historically were that maybe the head was on the top of the starfish and then the little where little feet come out and move the starfish around on that. Maybe that's more the body part. Maybe it was separated that way bilaterally. Or maybe the head is more out of the end of the arms like octopus brain style stuff. And then the body's more in the middle where the stomach is, which could, you could, you could see as possible. Um, but published this last week in nature, researchers have, uh, determined that, um, they have determined that the starfish, the, the echinoderm has through genetics, they, they, it's gotten rid of its body. Doesn't need it. All, it's all head, and that is it. It's all about the head. Um, the researchers uh, at the University of Berkeley, at uh, Stanford University, also at Chan Zuckerberg Bio Lab, um, they used genetic methods and a. a a method developed by Pacific Bio, Pac Bio, which is nanopore technology to be able to do long sequencing reads of the genetics uh, of these, these starfish that they looked at. And we're able to see that these sea stars and starfish, uh, they, all the genes led to, there's, n there's no body plan. Gene expression was exactly corresponding to the forebrain in humans was located along the midline of the sea star's arms and the human midbrain toward the outer edges of the arms. 
And then there are other subregions of the head that are expressed in the more trunk area. And um, now they want to look at a whole bunch of other related organisms to get an idea of um, how many other like, sea cucumbers, sea squirts, other echinoderm related org organisms have no bodies at all, just like the starfish. Do you there think you, you can get along without a body? <laughs> uh, well, I was just thinking about, uh, you know, the whole idea of alien life, how alien life is could very easily be different from how we conceive life being organized on Earth. And so maybe we've got aliens uh, in, the, uh, in the ocean, in the literal uh, areas, you know, just offshore. Uh, because uh, you mentioned octopus uh intelligence and yeah. the fact that they do have uh neural equipment in their arms that basically are a little bit autonomous that right. the, the those those uh neural networks in the arms can kind of do their own thing independent of of any sort of central nervous system whatever that means for an octopus and so uh, it sounds as if uh, this hints to a similar evolutionary path. It, it'd be interesting to see uh, what they find uh, with with other types of uh, creatures, sea cucumbers. Uh, uh, I know that a couple of years ago I was writing about the big uh, disaster that was hitting sea stars, uh, mm. that there was the an environmental disease. wasting yeah. disease. Yeah. yeah, And you kind of wonder uh, what... Uh, what what it would be like for uh, a sea star to be losing those arms and what the, how oh. does a sea star think would oh would my some gosh of that just drop off you just totally brought that to a completely different framing exactly that's it's not just losing a limb it's losing part of your brain losing part of your I mean your head well all the sense glad to blow your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm not a sea star because I would apparently have no head anymore. Blown completely. <laughs> um, let's see. Robots. Do you like robots? Uh, they're okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Historically, we have uh, we've uh, aired on the side of world robot domination on the show, yeah. rooting for the robots, but while at the same time, kind of hoping that humanity can, you know, we don't want to get on the robot's bad side. Yeah. Well, I, for one, welcome our new robot overlords. So there you go. Yeah. Well, thankfully, uh, apparently, to, uh, according to a, a review, a study in Frontiers in Robotics and AI published this week entitled, Do Robots Outperform Humans in Human-Centered Domains? Yes and no. So they tried to do an apples to apples comparison of humans versus robots. So Alan, do you have like any thoughts on like the problems that might come up there? <laughs> well, it's, it's like apples and oranges, no matter how you cut it, that, uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, artificial general intelligence versus some robot or actually an AI, agent that can play go or chess i think that some of the studies have indicated that it's a long way from being able to master something like a poker game even or warcraft world of warcraft or starcraft uh to go into the realm of general intelligence where you uh have to really uh come up with a solution to an a novel problem something you haven't faced before so there's a big debate over well can can uh ai agents actually do that you know for me the robot is just the mechanism it's actually mm -hmm. the software-based agent behind that that uh, really is the important, is more important, the important part. part yeah mm -hmm. and i think that's what this study really brings to the the front is that when they compared the uh the sensory systems eyes versus cameras, legs versus, you know, robotic limbs, um, the, 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 the speed or the strength or the 
sensory aspects of that particular system that a robot is designed to be good at using very often outperformed humans. But when it came to needing some kind of ability to, to adapt, to change your plan, to be able to move differently, um, you know, humans are still on top when it comes to that, because at this point, even with AI and even with the ability of AI to do all these, you know, new, new fangled things, where it's still not at the point of the human brain and nervous system and how the embodied human or even other embodied animals are designed to exist in their environments. Hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So bottom line, thankfully, do robots outperform humans? <laughs> kind of, but not uh, most of the time, not really. I mean, or when it comes down to it, humans are still better. You can't take the robots off the tether very long and they need lots of power and then their batteries die. We still haven't fixed that problem anyway. Um, yeah. If the robots ever to come to take over the world, make sure you can pull the plug or yeah. take the batteries out. Yeah. Just remember all of those fancy videos of the robots doing dance routines or calisthenics or whatever it is, they've been programmed and they have, those videos are very specifically made also to highlight how great the robots are, not the failures of the robots. It's all about, it's all about PR people. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> And in terms of other robots that, you know, don't need to outperform humans, but just it's the last story for this part of the show, um, Oregon, not Oregon, Ohio State University uh, is involved in uh, talking about a, a robot called the Rombot that was just published about in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And the Rombot is a soft bodied robot. And the idea behind the Rombot is that by using soft robotics, paleontologists, people who study old things from dead ground fossils, you know, soft fossils that might not actually have made fossils, right? Those soft organisms that might like the sea cucumbers that might not have turned into a fossil that could have been looked at by anyone, that we can use soft robots to try and mimic the bodies or what those old animals might have been like and give us an idea from what we know of the fossil record of how life might have moved, how it might have existed, and how it might have actually worked within an ecosystem. Um, but using, using robotics which I, I, I honestly was not looking for the day that I would be saying robots are helping paleontologists. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that one. It, this, uh, it's intriguing because uh, uh, you, we're talking about simulating how an ancient organism may have moved. And, and on one level, you can say, well, you can just build a software-based, totally, you know, digital simulation right. of what that organism might have been like, and you can tweak it and and see. Well, if if this muscle was here, maybe it would have moved in a slightly different way. And so, why do you need to build a soft robot to to do that? And, and so, it strikes me one of the stories that I had been covering for a long time. Uh, had to do with this guy, Nathan, Nathan Mervold, who was one of the uh, yeah. early executives at Microsoft. And he's a big... Uh, one of the fathers of computing. Yeah, but he's also, <laughs> he's also kind of a... <laughs> Yeah, he's a paleontologist. Uh, I mean, he he's a man about many things. He also yeah. writes cookbooks. Uh, but one of the yeah. things that he um, looked into is um, how fast could a dinosaur's tail move? And uh, his claim was that the tail could go supersonic. That he that the the, kind the of dinosaur like the, those, the shrimp. 
the the shrimp claws where it, like creating plasma bubbles maybe but more like <laughs> indiana jones cracking the whip you know yeah. that oh. and, and use that as a weapon yeah. and so there was a big debate over whether that could possibly be uh, you know, how fast could it move? Could it go supersonic? And so what he did uh, with his uh, fellow researchers was actually build a dinosaur tail that they could whip around oh, and, and do the analysis of. And so uh, he claimed that this this supported the idea that a dinosaur's tail could go supersonic. And other researchers have said, no, the material that the tail was made out of would not support uh, moving it at supersonic speeds. And so there, you know, again, there's a whole debate yeah. over what, uh, what a creature that lived, uh, 70 million years ago was capable of doing. And, and nobody can really yeah. probably definitively answer that question, but it makes for a fun debate. And it's kind of fun to see that dinosaur tail whipping around. Yeah. And so these robots, whether soft or hard are, right enabling researchers looking into the past to be able to maybe hopefully figure out a little bit more than they could otherwise. And you're right. Robots are fun. So and that, and that robots I, are fun. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to make a whip cracking robot a robot with a tail. Yeah. And maybe that'll be maybe how Nathan I get into will, battle bots. Maybe right? Nathan will let you whip the, whip the tail. <laughs> I, I think that would be a fun thing to have in an amusement park. Oh, gosh, that would be so much fun. Oh, my goodness. I hope that you all are having so much fun right now. This is This Week in Science. And I we've been talking a lot for the last half hour or so. And I just really want to take a moment to really introduce Alan and uh, let you all know who I have been talking to for the last half of the show. Alan Boyle is an award-winning science writer and someone I've had the honor to know for many years. I think the first time I met Alan was at a National Association of Science Writers meeting where you were my mentor and uh, were amazing at introducing me to people and helping me to learn just the very, very beginnings of the world of science communication that I've been delving into. And over the years, You've elucidated topics ranging from the Mir space station to making a case for Pluto. By the way, he wrote a book called The, Play the Case for Pluto. Uh, genetic genealogy, the future of energy, the new space race. I mean, you've written a lot about space, yeah. that's for sure. Um, and beyond. And you're writing for GeekWire and uh, Universe Today as well. And you have your own blog, The Cosmic Log, that you said has been going for about 22 years. You're hosting... The Fiction Science Podcast, which is amazing. And honestly, I so much. You've been doing so much. I want to find out what you've been doing lately, what you've been excited most about in science and space. And again, yeah. thank you so much for joining me. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you mentioned the Fiction Science Podcast, and yes. that was actually a pandemic project. It turned into that. Uh, okay. Oops. There was a colleague of mine at GeekWire who was really into science fiction. And so uh, I said, well, you know, in a couple of years, I'm going to maybe dial things back a little bit and I might have some more time. And wouldn't it be fun to do a podcast about the intersection of science and fiction? What what's yes. what sort of fiction does science inspire and, and what sort of uh, science is really contained in these works of fiction, whether it's the, the latest, uh, you know, uh, it, Ice and Fire from George R. R. Martin, how would dragons work if they really did exist? Or mm -hmm. uh, whether it's uh, The Expanse and uh, could you actually do some of yeah. the fight scenes that that you see on The Expanse? And I've, I've done my share of those stories through the years. And so I said, well, why don't we, why don't we do this? Let's, let's make a fiction science podcast. And so when the time came and I said, okay, it's time to do this. He said, uh, I'm too busy. I can't do it. No. But, <laughs> but he did put me in touch with Clarion West, uh, which is a writer's workshop in, in Seattle, and, and they have a lot of great writers come through there. And so the folks at Clarion West put me in touch with a science fiction writer named Dominica Fetaplace. And so she 
uh, is my co-host for the Fiction Science Podcast. And, and we've been doing this since, uh, since 2020. And uh, we're not at, in the wonderful. 900s yet. We're not in the 900s yet, like some people I know. But we're <laughs> uh, getting close to the 50 podcast mark. So that, that's uh, been... That's great. That's, yeah. It's been fun. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Padawan, yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, the, the the latest one that we did uh, was on space, which of course is a p favorite topic of mine. We've we've uh, I've done a lot of stories about the commercial space race and and the implications and and you know the bigger issues uh, surrounding how our uh, how are humans going to get into mm -hmm. space and, and uh, build a long-term future there? Uh, is space settlement actually realistic? This is something, obviously, that Elon Musk has talked about quite a bit, you know, making humanity into a multi-planet species and building yeah. a city on Mars. And they talk and, about the, this generation being the Mars generation. Right, right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, and Jeff Bezos talking about having millions of people living and working in space. Uh, I've, I've heard this for, for many years and have reported on what their visions are. And so uh, a couple of folks, uh, Zach uh, Wienersmith and, and his wife, Kelly Wienersmith, he's a cartoonist. If, if you know Saturday morning breakfast cereal, he does mm -hmm. that cartoon. And Kelly uh, is an, uh, is a biologist, uh, basically a behavioral. Uh, she's a parasitologist yes. and okay. and also a behavioral ecologist. And okay. so, yes. but they have done you know a lot of looking into what's the what's the reality behind the vision here? They did a book called Soonish, which mm -hmm. looked at 10, 10 emerging technologies. And so they followed up with this book called A City on Mars. And what they expected to do was to um, have kind of a guidebook, like, oh yeah, we're going to have space settlements and this is what they're gonna be like. But when they started looking into it, they discovered, oh, there are some real problems here. And one of the biggest problems is how are people going to reproduce in space? Nobody knows what zero gravity or reduced gravity is going to mean for uh, for reproduction and development of children. Yeah, and we, so, can, we can make salad, maybe. <laughs> salad, yeah. But salad. kids? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, so th that was one of the big issues that they pointed out is that a whole lot more research needed to be done into, uh, into, uh, reproduction and, uh, development, uh, and also space law, uh, that huh, yeah. I, I, I've been covering space law as it relates to property rights in space for, for, for yeah, more than a decade. It, it's, uh, they were talking about this. There was actually a law in 2015 where the federal government said, okay, uh, we can't claim territory. Uh, we can't claim sovereignty over territory on another celestial body. But if you're a U.S. person, if you're an American commercial venture, you can extract whatever you can extract from an asteroid or a, or a moon. And that could be problematic when, you know, you've got China and Russia, Russia fighting and over, yeah. All those over, resources. Over maybe, the good maybe stuff. Everybody launched to get to the same asteroid. And we're right. all trying mm -hmm. to, you know, are we going to work together or are the, is it going to be corporation versus corporation? And, and what, are, uh, what are the legalities to all of yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah. And if you've yeah. watched the For All Mankind TV show, you know that it it's pretty problematic. I so. haven't watched it because I'm like so scared of it being too depressing. Oh, <laughs> no, dystopian. no. It's, it, it's cool. <laughs> you, you, you should. Like, okay. uh, may, maybe I'll, I'll have to find out if I can gift you some access to Apple TV because uh, <laughs> it, it's an alternate universe show, and which, which yeah. I always like. You know, yeah. what if show. So it's going to be 2003 and there are people on Mars. So. That, awesome. But it's fun. But anyway, uh, that was what we discussed with uh, Zach. 
is what what's the reality and what needs to be done and and so that was a a fun podcast that's addressed a subject that i've covered for many many years and 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 another one is artificial intelligence we talked a little bit about artificial intelligence and you know generative ai is a, a big issue now and one of the one of the folks in the science fiction community who has done the best job of of telling that story and delving into the implications of generative AI is Ted Chang, who lives here in the right. Seattle area. And he's I didn't the guy. He yeah. Was in, yeah. The three body problem. Is that the book? No, uh, no. He, he, he actually is a short story writer oh, and uh, right. he's best known for writing the short story on which the movie arrival is based. And this whole idea of how do you communicate with say starfish, Right? How do you <laughs> communicate with a starfish? Yeah, if you remember that movie, the the aliens look a lot like starfish, and maybe they had their brains in their arms, for all we know. It's, but, it, uh, or maybe they had, yeah, they yeah, maybe their their brain was all over. Yeah, I remember um, interviewing the uh, the science advisor for the uh, the who was the linguist for Arrival uh-huh. yeah. when that movie wow. came out. Um, and I just love the way that they were able to take the reality of how a linguist works and you know what they would put on a whiteboard and how they'd start to try and piece together the basics of a language. Um, and you know, this huge, this wonderful story came out of, you know, this very insightful short story by Ted. So um, Yeah. Yeah. You know, so um yeah, so we the did AI have, stuff that he's yeah, working yeah, on. Yeah, we, we had him, him I, I moderated a panel with Ted and actually the the screenwriter uh for Arrival uh talking awesome. about what's going on with the uh screen actors and the screenwriters strike over yeah. generative AI. And uh, just in the last few hours there was a report that uh the actors guild was reaching a tentative settlement with tentative, the yes. Studios. Maybe yeah. maybe at twelve oh one AM mm-hmm. the strike will be over and we can get new seasons of shows that we like. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. New new seasons of For All Mankind, season five. So That's there right. you go. Yeah. But uh generative AI uh, was a huge uh, issue in those strikes and uh, the whole idea of well there's a digital twin like uh, uh, actors have their bodies scanned so right. that and they can, the they can generate that. yeah that's right and who has the rights and what happens when the actor dies and mm-hmm. uh, the the studios were saying well we'll compensate you while you're living uh, for the use of your digital likeness. But once you're dead, it belongs to us. And so that did not sit well with, with the actors. So, but those are the sorts of issues that I love getting into. Just And, and like you said, with issues. your conversation, um, also the question relating to, you know, these the techno... Techno the, the optimists, techno, the, the, manifesto, yeah, techno, yeah. yeah just the Mark Andreessen like Elon manifesto Musk and Mark and, Andreessen, and all these guys, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. How is how does their viewpoint play into the development of the technology that we're using, and how is that going to influence the artificial intelligence that is going to be applied that to our everyday? Right, and, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's a huge. Uh, I'm. We're going to be watching that, and I, I'm sure that uh, there will be more about that in Cosmic Log as the weeks and months and years go on. But uh, I, I did want to mention that Ted is going to be speaking about generative AI again uh, later this week in Seattle at a, Town and, Hall Seattle. And so. you've uh, given me a link to that so we can make that available on yeah. our website but that for anyone who is in Seattle you might want to uh, check this out because that might be a really interesting conversation yeah. and, and it I benefits it. Clarion thinking. West it, it, <laughs> <laughs> it benefits Clarion West which was so helpful to me in actually getting fiction science off the ground so it's Fantastic. like this is coming full circle so Absolutely. That, that's very cool um and then yeah a from ai to what's the uh, what other places yeah 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 yeah. i i mean space has been kind of my go-to place for a quarter century uh i i remember i was at msnbc uh back Mm -hmm. in something like 2000 uh, 1998 
And, You're like, do uh, that. No, go back. No, further. no. 1998. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this guy named Peter Diamandis came into the office and he said, oh, I've got this idea. Yeah. I want to do a $10 million prize for the first private, uh, privately funded uh, mission into space. And so that's how the X Prize got started, and uh, and uh, that's kind of opened the way for all these players in the in the commercial space sphere to to do their thing. And and NASA kind of got the idea. Oh well, let's let's leave it more of the responsibility with commercial ventures to to get us into space. Like we we maybe we don't need to own our Ares 5 yeah. rocket. Let's let this crazy company called SpaceX do it. And that's how the SpaceX revolution got started is that NASA decided to take a chance on them. And here now and Elon Musk other, is the yeah. richest guy in the world. And if other uh, space companies had gotten their rockets working faster or you know can come up with something cheaper, better, then maybe they might take over space spacex's contracts who knows that's uh that's an issue i mean that's right? an issue that that a lot of people have been talking about is spacex too dominant in mm -hmm. the commercial space area it, is this a an, is, it a is this a problem yeah yeah so that's that's something to be covering too but uh there are a couple of things other than space that that I'm really interested in. One is electric transportation, specifically electric aviation. There's a lot going on here in the Seattle area. Uh, there's there's a company called Eviation, which is testing mm -hmm. an all electric airplane. There's another company called Magna X, which is building an electric propulsion system. Uh, you see uh, different companies, different air carriers saying, hey, we want to go electric. We realize that that the aviation industry is not as sustainable in this era that we're living in where we're concerned about uh, carbon emissions and climate change. We realize that we need to do something about it. And so maybe this electric aviation revolution is something that they want to be a part of. And so th that's another thing that I've been covering. What are the issues? So electric aviation, you're going to be dealing with battery issues. You have That's to right. Be, like, so it's not just like biofuels, which is like your tank of fuel, but uh, this is entirely like similar to electric cars, entirely right. new systems that have to be mm -hmm. developed. And so that is the issue is uh, what's the range? And right now the battery technology is not going to support uh, airplanes going you know, you can't take an airplane from uh, Portland to London uh, just on electric power. Maybe, right. maybe Portland to Seattle, maybe uh, Portland more. to Cannon Beach. Uh, right, so that, a little more, more puddle jumper kind of flights. Exactly, which are probably mm -hmm. more polluting to begin with. Right. When you think about mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So oh. that's that's uh, there's a company called Harbor Air that's based in the Vancouver, v B.C. area, and they want to go all electric with their fleet because what they do is they fly seaplanes to different destinations, mostly in British Columbia. And, and so yeah. they're testing uh, retrofitted uh, electric airplanes right now. Uh, they're, they're actually uh, older de Havilland beavers that they've retrofitted wow. with electric propulsion systems. So, so yeah. as a bird scientist, you know, I, I got my PhD in bird brains. And one yeah. of the things uh, that is an issue with birds is, is weight. And so there's this idea that birds that migrate very often, their brains get smaller when they don't need to use them. And then they get bigger when they do need to use them because they want to optimize for their weight. Mm. And so mm -hmm. when I think of electric planes and batteries, I think heavy. I think that this is going to be a right. very heavy thing. Why not do fuel cells? Why not like what is like to me that like this is it, is the weight of the battery? Do you know this? Is the weight of the battery at, like at the same level as the weight of the fuel that they would normally be carrying? Or and the uh, hardware, I mean, the hardware, the, the the hardware for an electric, uh, for uh, uh, gas powered uh, 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 propulsion system, you know, yeah. that, that you, to some extent, you're trading the weight of uh, all that uh, metal 
for a lighter uh, motor system. But you're right that the weight is a big constraint. That's why you know the use of carbon composites is sort of an enabling technology to mm -hmm. to do this. And uh, the idea is that Beautiful. the the companies that are are in this field are actually trying to hit a moving target that that yeah. plane that you're seeing right there, they were able to do that initial test, but in order to do they, what they want to do, they're really counting on battery technology to advance yes. over the next five years. And so, like I say, you're you're trying to hit a moving target. And haven't, as- we, Haven't we been waiting for battery technology to advance for like- Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, battery <laughs> breakthrough. <laughs> I, I used to joke about uh, what's the battery breakthrough headline for this week. Exactly. And it, it, uh, so, but yeah. it's got to be solved, I think, in order to open the way for electric transportation. But so and, and it's a little yeah. bit of a chicken and egg problem that, yeah. that you have to build a market for it. And I think that the market is starting to coalesce for that. So... Yeah, and I would I would think that the the market would generally be there for flight that is you know, less, you know, if you've got a plane, you've got a plane. I think people are going to trust, you know, are going to accept that that's going to work. But mm -hmm, I don't mm -hmm. think that market is going to be a problem. But yeah. Anyway. And then you mentioned bird brains. And yes. uh, I'm fascinated by the study of the brain and especially the nature of consciousness. Uh, we do have a researcher at the Allen Institute here in Seattle named Christoph Koch, who has yes. done quite a bit of work on that. And in fact, uh, he is focusing on an, uh, an objective measure of consciousness. I think it's called the phi factor uh, and, uh, and trying to see it, it's related to the interconnectedness of a network that you would be hmm. able to kind of determine what the consciousness of a system might be based on how you measure that interconnectedness. And uh, an another fun thing is that he, he is interested in the uh, application of psychedelic drugs that oh, uh, magic mushrooms that, yeah. uh, and that's something that psilocybin is, is uh, kind of coming more to the fore as a type of therapy. And what does that do to the brain? What are the effects? Do, can it help with things like PTSD? Uh, we're seeing more in that, but we're also seeing uh, the issues. Uh, I don't know if you remember that case of the, the guy who it, it, he was a pilot I think on a Horizon Air flight, who tried to turn the engines off. No, that was Alaska Airlines. It was ah, landed okay. here in Portland, where I live. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. But, he was but, he was on his day off, decided to hop on a flight to somewhere else, and just happened to take magic mushrooms for the first right. time. <laughs> Oops! And so, now I'm suddenly trying to shut down the plane's engines. So oh, that's geez. an illustration of the problem, <laughs> <laughs> the potential problem with psychedelic drugs. So. Oh, uh, that could so, have happened at any time, though. Not. It's just now that people are. I think you know, these stories are highlighted because we are looking at them more as treatments, and so it's yeah. And and I think they're the those they're becoming a little bit more accessible. That that uh, I don't know where he got his magic mushrooms, but but uh, I think it's possible in some uh, states, perhaps including Oregon, to perhaps. to be prescribed uh, <laughs> psychedelic drugs as a therapy. So yeah. 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 So, so those yeah, are fascinating. Yeah. And actually, the nature of consciousness is going to be the subject of our next fiction science podcast in, in a couple of weeks. We'll be talking with it. George Musser. He's a science writer who has written a book about the subject called Putting Ourselves Back in the Equation. So that's a look oh, at. And, and he talks about how a lot of physicists or cosmologists, people who have been interested in the nature of the universe, are getting interested in the nature of consciousness as well. Mm -hmm. And they're actually pretty well suited to, to do that kind of work. And so I'm looking forward to talking with George about that. And, and you can stay tuned for that on I Fiction can't... Science Podcast in a couple of weeks. I love that. I can't wait to hear that one, actually, because I've met George and he is just wonderful and his writing is fantastic. So, um, yeah, I'm sure that's going to just be a, just a wonderful conversation. And also the book itself is probably going to be a wonderful read. I will, I'm going to put that on my list, actually. Okay. Physic physicists. All the physicists get to do the fun stuff. I want to do the fun stuff. 
Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> I'm talking with you. That's the fun stuff. Well, I do not want to keep you overly long, and it has been a, an amazing hour of conversation. I have to talk about cats. I, I do definitely need to tell people about cats because I primed everyone at the top of the hour about yep. cats. Bring on but the cats. If you are, Would you like to leave before I bring on the cats? No, I'll, I'll be with you for the cats. Okay, they'll stay for my cat stories. I yeah, love it. yeah. <laughs> All right, so let me tell everyone right now, if you are just starting to uh, listen or watch at this moment, this is This Week in Science, and I am joined tonight by Alan Boyle. We're talking all about science and really interesting stories and his podcast, The Fiction Science Podcast, and what is going on in his world. And if you are interested in supporting Twist, head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link because we are listener, listener supported. You can choose your level of support and honestly, your support helps us so much. Thank you for your support. We can't do it without you. You can also hit those Zazzle links. The Zazzle store is full of merchandise and lots of great stuff that will help uh, keep our show going into the future, which we're talking about right now. But right now, no, right now, on This Week in Science, I am going to tell you about cats. And Alan, are you ready? You're ready for the cats. I'm ready. Okay. Do you like cats? I'm a dog person. You're Sorry. A dog person. Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. some of this you're going to be like, mm hmm, I knew it. And others <laughs> <laughs> you might find just interesting. So, first off, there aren't as many cat species as there are other mammalian species. And researchers have been trying to figure out what the barriers to speciation have been through the years with various cats. And there's one study out this last week in Current Biology talking about limited historical admixture between European wildcats and domestic cats. And in this study, they looked at these wildcats and domestic cats that have been cohabitating in Europe for 2,000 years and really only recently have had their reproductive isolation eroded. And so they think that the reason for this is human influences because it's only really, really recently that these wild cats have started to, uh, to breed with the house cats. So other interesting study that follows right on the heels of this one, a genome sequencing project looked into cat evolution. This is from Texas A&M School of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. And the researchers who are interdisciplinary, they published in Nature Genetics, they determined that cats, cat species, unlike primates and a lot of other uh, mammals, that the cat chromosomes don't have as many what are called segmental duplications, which are like we were talking about earlier, these really similar copies of genes and these little segments that are copied and copied and copied and copied. Primates, we have lots and lots and lots of places where these segmental duplications take place. Cats do not. And specifically within cats, they have one uh, area on an, the X chromosome that is where a lot of the genetic rearrangements take place. And so there's a specific repetitive element that they've isolated called DXZ4 that is responsible, at least mostly, for the isolation of the domestic and jungle cats. Why they have isolated and don't interbreed with other species as e easily. Um, and this DXZ4 is a repeat. It's a gene that changes the three-dimensional structure of the chromosome itself. It doesn't, it's not just a gene that's like, and now you have brown hair, and now you have white hair, and now, no, it is, it has a role in the three-dimensional structure, and thus the way that the chromosome itself has interactions for translation, transcription, and for copying when it comes time for making copies of genes and interactions. So they don't know the exact mechanisms, but because of the way that they've been looking at these cats and their genomes, they have been able to uh, 
use a method that allows them to take the first generation of hybrids to be able to figure out exactly how much comes from the parental and the maternal sides of the family and have been able to really start to piece together the genetics of the cats and why cats don't breed with other cats all that often and why you have weird meowy rowery bengal cats or you know a normal house cat it comes down to these very interesting genetic quirks and on another genetic quirk note this is work done by a friend of mine jonathan eisen and his his team of collaborators uh, one of his i, I believe postdocs um, has most recently uh, published this is a second paper in a uh, series of papers investigating microbiome and volatile compounds in anal gland secretions from domestic cats. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, so if you do have one of those Bengal cats and it's male and it sprays all over the place, or if you have a cat and they're spraying or every once in a while you might hear about, oh, the cats and their infected anal gland, whatever. Well, these anal glands are very important to cats for marking and for identifying themselves. And in this particular study that was just published in scientific reports, they used metabolomics and metagenomics to make really, really pretty pictures of all the microbes that are involved in the makeup of the, uh, of the anal glands of cats and they found that they are varied then yes cats smell differently because they have different microbes and different microbes are involved with creating different compounds that make different stinks so those glands that are really important to the way your cat smells not how it smells and uses olfaction, but how it, uh, this, the way it produces an odor are very bacterially based. And then that goes back again to the genetics of the cat and how there are very specific olfactory genes that have been preserved over periods of time, but they're also very, um, very defined for particular species and individuals genetically within cat species. This is bacteria to cats to bacteria to cats, and it's a never ending. But it, anyway, these researchers made a pretty picture. Yikes. Uh, so cat pee is a pretty, you know, uh, it's an important research topic. <laughs> and I'm, <laughs> I'm reminded of, uh, I'm reminded of this whole issue about toxoplasma. Have, have you uh delved that, into that the, oh, the very much the zombie a... parasite and and how cats mm -hmm. kind of spread toxoplasma that uh, and uh yep and you are tossing me to the very last story of the night so neatly <laughs> Toxo... there's one thing i want to say though i want uh, there's <laughs> one thing i want to say about cat pee is uh, yeah. that there have been studies uh there's one study i'm looking at here Fatal attraction phenomenon in humans. Cat odor attractiveness is increased for toxoplasma infected men while decreased for oh. infected women. So if you if you have a, a male partner who suddenly seems to be more attracted to the cat in the house, <laughs> or the get cat nervous. is more attracted to them. <laughs> get nervous. Maybe this has something to do with right who people go, I don't know why cats like me. <laughs> Watch out for toxoplasma. Yeah, well, toxo has been an ongoing topic on This Week in Science for many, many years. We yes. discussed Justin has an ongoing feud with cats uh, or against cats um, because of the fact that they become infected with toxoplasma and can pass that infection on to human hosts number of countries around the world have massive infection rates because cats are more out outdoor and there isn't as much uh 
infrastructure for keeping keeping things clean. And so you have these incredible infection rates. United States, we have maybe like 10 to 20% or up to maybe 15% infection rates, infectivity rates for people uh, who are cat owners or who come across cats, but it can be really, really high up to 65% in some places um, in the world. Anyway, last story of the night, not only can Toxoplasma gondii make you more or less attractive to a cat based on the way you smell. It's also going to possibly make you more frail as you age. So if you have a cat that's been an outdoor cat and you've possibly kept a dirty litter box or dug in dirt outside in your garden that has been used by an infected cat and you've become infected with Toxoplasma gondii, this team at the University of Colorado Boulder, University of Maryland, and University of A Coruña in Spain have determined and published in the Journal of Gerontology, Medical Science, that uh, adults over the age of 65, and in this it was 601 Spanish and Portuguese adults, um, who, uh, when they had a measure known as frailty, right, just, they get hurt more easily. They're not as much energetic. It's very... not. 67% of the subjects were seropositive for a latent T. gondii infection. So not an active infection, but just being infected and having the T. gondii in their bodies. So they don't have an association, and this is where a lot of this stuff breaks down uh, when we talk about T. gondii, is that uh, it's a question of cause causality. And um, so researchers can't tell whether or not this is causal necessarily, but there is a correlation between toxo, kitty cats, getting old, being frail. Just a correlation. I'm glad I'm a dog person. <laughs> I'm a cat person. So I'm like, maybe I need to go clean the litter box. <laughs> <laughs> go keep that clean, keep that box a little more clean but yes i hope everyone out there loves their cats and sleeps well with those little purring predators in their beds this evening huh on that note yeah exactly is that <laughs> <laughs> this is how I try to send people off to bed with a little bit of nightmare juice just to make you you know sprightly i'm gonna i'm gonna fight the frailty just by <laughs> just by adding a little bit of fun alan thank you so much for joining me on the show tonight and for staying a little bit later than uh than the nine o'clock hour where can people find you i'm gonna okay. put this on the website okay. for sure wow. but let's repeat those websites over again yeah so that we yeah. make sure to so... put it out there well, uh, cosmiclog.com, I put all my stories in some form or another on cosmiclog.com, and that includes stories related to the Fiction Science Podcast. Uh, you can go to fictionscienceclub.com or fictionscience.club, but just go to Cosmic Log and, and root around there. You might find a Fiction Science Podcast, or you might find a story about toxo-infected cats. Who knows? Oh, I hope so. Uh, but right? I do write for I do write for geekwire.com and for universetoday.com. And so you'll probably find my stories and and a lot more other cool stuff from other writers on those websites. So that that does it. I'm I'm on Twitter and threads and blue sky and mastodon and the uh, fractionalization you know, of media Facebook, has happened. Uh, MeWe. I've got a list of 14 places where I have to tell you. What's stories. that one? Oh, I oh don't even know. yeah. Yeah. It, I don't think you want to go there. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> that crazy about MeWe, but somebody said, Oh, you got to put it on there. I don't like Facebook. So put it on MeWe. And so I probably have, you know, <laughs> 20 <laughs> followers there, but it includes this guy who asked me to do it. So I did. So there, if you've got good. some place you want me to post my stories on social media, let me know and I'll add that to the How list of doing? 14. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. These days. Oh my goodness. But yes, it's good to have a home. So Cosmic Log is a good start That's for people. That's the place. To, That's the place. To find you, which yeah. is the place. 
All right, everyone, we have come to the end of the show. Thank you so much for joining us for another amazing episode of This Week in Science. I do want to make sure to uh, thank everyone who is involved in making this show possible. All of you who are in the chat rooms right now, thank you so much to those of you who are in the Discord, the YouTube, the Facebook, the Twitch for being here and being part of a conversation. Thank you, Fada, for your time on show notes and social media, all that, all those social medias. Gord, R and Laura, others, thanks for ke helping keep the chat room safe places. Identity Four, thank you for recording the show. Rachel, thank you for editing the show. And as always, I do need to thank our Patreon sponsors. So it is time to thank them very carefully. Thank you to Arthur Kepler, Kepler Craig Potts, Mary Gertz, Teresa Smith, Richard Badge, Bob Coles, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, George Chorus, Pierre Velazarb, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Chris Wozniak, Vagard Shefstad, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Reagan Shubru, Sarah Forfar, Mundus, P.I.G., Stephen Albron, Sterile Myshek, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredis 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Verdon, Noodles Jack, Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Sean Clarence Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hesmolosti, Lise Mineke, Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Richard Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Romy Day, G. Burton, Lattimore, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, RDM, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramis, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Adam Mishkanik, mm -hmm. Kevin Perrin-Chan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul D. Disney, David Simile, Patrick Pecoraro, and Tony Steele. Thank you so much for supporting us on Patreon. We can't do it without you. And if you want to be a Patreon supporter, make sure that you head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link. Woo! Next week's show, I'll be back. It'll be a surprise who I'm with, with next week. It's like that mystery wrapped chocolate. What's inside every week? You don't know what you're going to get, I can tell you. I, maybe Natalia Regan, I'm not sure, but that's who I've been talking with. We'll be back. I will be back for sure next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And also you can find information at twist.org. If you want to listen to us as a podcast, we're on all the podcast places. For information, you can go to our website, twist.org, and you can sign up for our newsletter. You can email us directly if you want to say, hey, Blair, how's your baby? Email her, Blair Baz at twist.org. Uh, twist you can email me about show stuff, ask me stupid questions at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. You can email Justin at twistminion at gmail.com and say, hey, Justin, where'd you go? And he probably will ignore you. But in the meantime, you just put twists in the subject line so that you don't get spam filtered into a kitty cat's microbially filled anal sack. That was not a good way to end this. But we will be back here next week and hope that you will join us once again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, please remember, it's all in your head. And change your litter box. <laughs> This week in science. <laughs> this week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen. And this is the after show, which we normally do an after show, but I just want to say goodbye and good night, Alan. Thank you so much for spending some extra time. Live long time. and prosper. Oh, nanu nanu. And <laughs> live long and prosper. We have to go back and forth and see if you can. It's here. Uh, right. Not very well. Not very well. Yeah. Can you do the both? <laughs> that was fun. Thank you for joining yeah. me. Okay. Really yeah. It. Great to see you. Yeah. One of these That's days wonderful. in Seattle or Portland, we'll have to yes. get together. There must be real path crossing. Mm -hmm. All right. That's a deal. Yeah, it is a deal. Thank you and have a wonderful night. Okay. Take care. Thanks, Kiki. Thank mm -hmm. you. Sure. 
All right, everyone, I am probably going to be heading for the bed and not hanging out a really long time tonight. I can uh, take a few minutes. Less than 80 minute show. I know it's amazing. We did it. <laughs> Alan was great. He was a, he was wonderful. He wanted to leave at nine o'clock because he has work to do. Who doesn't have things to do? He probably needs to hang out with his dog or like hang, I don't know, talk to his family or something. I don't know. Something very important, which is, I mean, that kind of stuff is very important. I know, Paul Disney, it is so short. Yes, it is a short show. And, um, you know, this may be the way it is for a little, little few weeks. We have these shorter shows and it is nice and it is fun, but because it's different. Um, yeah. And maybe we have a nice time together and we are thankful that we have to, a nice time with friends and science and, oh, I have a little uh, wheeziness right now because I have had a cold or something. I have not been COVID positive, but I have been hiding in my house. My whole family's had it. There's been the sniffling and the coughing and the aching and the tiredness and the not good. Oh, yes. And yes, also the time change. Yes. No, I don't know. I always like the fall time change. It just like, it's like taking me home to where time is supposed to be. The springtime is like, I feel like it's a theft and it is stolen from me. Even, I don't know. There's just, there's something about the fall time change that I think it makes me happy. It does not make my cats happy. <laughs> They're like, why haven't you fed me yet? I don't understand what's going on. I am hungry now. Yes. Oh boy. But yes, um, I was text, not texting. I was talking with Natalia Regan about her joining the show next week. I will confirm that as soon as I can, um, to determine if I can get that wonderful, funny lady to join. I think, I think she is a, a wonderful, uh, science communicator. Uh, she's a comedian. She does some, she's doing some great work right now doing TikToks and reels. And uh, like, I, I don't know if they only for like just one that she shares on all the platforms, but her, her work is hilarious. It's wonderful. She's very funny. And the two of us will probably sit and talk in funny voices to each other all evening about science, which I think could be very enjoyable. It could be good. And everyone out there, I hope that uh, you all have an amazing, amazing week. I mean, if there's nothing, yeah. Getting to work at 6.30 would be easy this week. You'll get used to it, though, Paul. You will. Thank everyone for joining us. I'm just looking at the scrolling through the chat at all the people who were talking tonight. Thank you all of you who were here and who joined. Um, I'm gonna, yes, take myself to bed, put myself to bed and hope that I am feeling much better tomorrow because I'm supposed to be going to a conference in Long Beach. <laughs> and I think I have to change my flights. I don't know. I can pretend to be healthy in my own house, but I don't know if I should be around other people. What are you supposed to do? As long as that COVID test is negative, radio. Oh boy. Oh boy, oh boy. Yeah, as long as I have no symptoms, then I will be fine. And that is part of getting the good night's sleep. So all of you, I hope that you are staying healthy, staying out of trouble. Well, I don't know, as long as it's good trouble, maybe the trouble is fine. Um, and, uh, what do we say at the end of the show? I feel so weird missing Justin. I miss Blair, but we're going to keep on keeping on. And thank you for joining me this week also after um, I canceled the episode last week. It was just too much, too much last week uh, between scheduling and family and all the stuff that was going on. So I do not having, I mean, not having my normal team um, it kind of threw a wrench in the works. Oh, awesome. R and Laura, you can sub for Justin. <laughs> Tap in. 
All right. Well, I am going to try not to sneeze on camera. <laughs> And I hope that you all stay healthy, stay happy. Nope. Okay, off camera sneeze. That's what we do. Wait, there'll probably be another one in a second. Okay, but stay happy, stay healthy. I hope you. I, I hope you're happy. Um, stay like in or out of trouble, whether <laughs> whatever works for you. Stay safe and stay lucky. Right, that's the favorite one. We'll see you next time. I'll be back here next week. And I look forward to getting to talk with all of you again. Have a good night. Have a good week.